people think and talk about climate change. Um, but if we look at the statistics, the um, where the boundaries, the planetary boundaries are, actually climate change is at crisis level, but it's not into full disaster yet. We're going, we're fast heading towards that wall, um, but we've actually already smashed into the wall, which is biodiversity collapse. And so it's, it's quite a sobering thing, but we can also look at what we can be doing going forward. Um, so what I'd like to do is just, we'll go across uh, there. You'd, uh, you'll be far better at introducing yourselves than I could ever do. Um, so maybe you introduce yourself and uh, your organization, and then we'll kind of, what I like to have is think about this as just being kind of like a little chat in a coffee room between the four of us, and it just happens that you guys are somewhere out in the darkness watching us. Um, so, Nora. Um, so my name is Nora Gerby and I'm the founder of Who Cares and what Who Cares does is that it identifies different topics every year that we address through movements of thinking. So we write articles, we create campaigns, we try to mobilize as many people around these campaigns. So we had one last year that was called Dress Like You Care and we're actually working on one that's called Live Like You Care or Eat Like You Care where we get communities to rethink the way that they go about their lifestyle. This year we um, coined, I coined a topic that I called environmental intelligence. And if you look at environmental intelligence, the wording is actually applied only to analysis when you do environmental work, piping, that engineering. And I thought it would be interesting to, to apply the word to ourselves and uh, how we've become uh, environmentally intelligent deficient and how we should get back to that intelligence, and I can tell more about it after. But I also wear another hat. I'm also the chief representative for the City of London in France, and uh, we also work uh, actively at making sure that uh, France and London work together at making our country, France, and London, the city, more environmentally intelligent. Yeah, great stuff. Thank you. It's an interesting day today to be representing London no. in France. <laughs> Julie. About that. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julie Valbon. I'm the CEO of a company called Maison du Monde, so Houses of the World, for those of you who don't speak French. Um, we are create, manufacture, and distribute furniture and homeware products, uh, manufactured mainly in Asia, but also in Europe. Uh, we are present in 12 countries um, across uh, 380 stores in the web and we're a company of 8,000 people. We are a public company in France, which is a, a good topic for later discussion. Oh, sorry, just wanted to add that three years ago, four years ago now, we created that own foundation uh, for um, the preservation and restoration of uh, forest uh, with obviously a, a lot of impact on uh, biodiversity and every year, we give um, a share of our, of our sales to the foundation and we also allow our 5 million customers uh, to do micro donations uh, that contribute directly to the foundation projects. Brilliant, thank you. Stefan. Right, thanks. Uh, so I'm Stefan, I'm the founder and uh, CEO of uh, Reforest Action. Reforest Action is a company uh, dedicated to protecting, restoring and planting forests uh, in different countries. Uh, I'm not Fior Longo, though. Oh, no, no, no sorry. It's not that. Don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> and um, so th we we act on forests in different countries, 20, con uh, 20 countries in uh, each continent. We act in France, in Europe, and in South America, Africa, and Asia. And um, we act on forests because we strongly believe that uh, forest is a living place um, where biodiversity can be restored and can increase in a very efficient way, and that's one of our main focus alongside of uh, climate change as well. Great, thank you. So uh, the first question that I wanted to talk about was that there's this immense global problem, but there's like multiple reasons why we might want to, to, to deal with it. Um, and I'd just be interested as to, to, to what comes up for you when I say kind of why would we want to work with biodiversity conservation? Who would like to, yeah, Nora? On a personal level, why I'm getting involved with it? Yeah. Ah, that's a good question. Um, on a personal level, um, I 
the basis of Who Cares was started actually when I was about 11 years old. Um, I'm a native Aboriginal North African, and I used to spend some time there. And in the 80s, uh, when I was a kid going there, uh, the infrastructure was very different than the one I was exposed to in France and in Canada, because I'm also Canadian. And, um, and then one time the water ran out for many, many days, and we were so lucky that we had a well in the... Uh, well, in the in the property that we we had a summer holiday, and we were able to access water that time uh, during that 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 very long time. It lasted more than two weeks. Um, but why it was important is that after a few days, my uncle opened the gates of our property and decided to share the the well with the, the rest of the villagers that didn't have access to water. Um, I think when you're 11 years old and you're exposed to that, it it's I mean that scene stayed uh, within me for a very long time. And then I, as I grew up, I realized that there were the inequalities kept on growing. Mm -hmm. They were not diminishing, they were actually growing. Um, and so on a personal level, I got involved very quickly in international relations and working for governments. And previously I was working for the French government in the environment and um, in Canada and in, in with France as well. And, and I think that it's just, uh, I think it's impossible today for anybody to not want to be doing anything on that scale, even in a small scale. I think we we all feel compelled. Um, and just to close it, I think I, I, I've been involved with Change Now since the beginning of uh, Change Now, and it's been incredible to see a conference grow this fast in just three editions. Um, and I'm incredibly moved, actually, to answer your question, and then I'll pass it on to my co-speakers, but I'm incredibly moved by the number of volunteers, not so much by the numbers, but also by the passion and the willingness to want to be involved in um, being a hero for the planet. I think, uh, I don't know if I've answered your question. No, no, perfect, thank you. I tried. Thank you, follow that. <laughs> um, well, uh, I had my first personal experience of the importance of biodiversity 15 years ago when I got to spend six months in Honduras in Latin America. Back then I was working for an American NGO to do social work. We were trying to revitalize the fine cocoa sector to uh, produce gourmet chocolates because it was the only way for small producers uh, to get a decent living. So it was really a social dimension where I was there to try to, uh, to get uh, those uh, small farmers a better living. And actually, fine cocoa, um, fine cocoa tree is very fragile. It's a very rare, very fragile tree. And we came to understand that to revitalize that sector, we had to provide a healthy environment, which came with shadow, which came with trees. Basically, there was a beginning of agroforestry uh, in that country. And we need to, um, to, to really uh, build a healthy ecosystem and, and enrich biodiversity for these fine cocoa trees to grow and for these small farmers to, um, to, to, to get a, a, a decent living. So I came to understand that everything is related and uh, we, we try and I had the discussion earlier on, we try to see, okay, shall I get involved for environmental challenges, for social challenges, actually everything is connected. We might want to take it from one angle or the other angle first, but Everything is just one. Um, so, and I think this is biodiversity, right? This is the idea of having this full ecosystem. It's the beauty and the big challenge of it. Mm. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, I, I act for biodiversity because I belong to it. And uh, acting for biodiversity is acting for myself, right? And um, uh, I created Reforest Action after visiting an uh, agroforestry project in Senegal. Uh, I didn't know anything about forest and trees and biodiversity. It was not my topic. But then I experienced something. I planted a tree, a mango tree, and this mango tree today delivers fruits, additional incomes to uh, very uh, poor people locally, and uh, but also you know um, stores CO2 emissions, uh, uh, generates uh, oxygen and uh, increases, develops biodiversity locally. And that was 10 years ago. And, and since then, I've learned a lot of things about trees and forests and biodiversity. And what I've uh, learned, uh, it's, uh, you know, scientific uh, figures, topics. I've understood all of that. 
But then I've uh, also learned how to fill it, how to be sensitive about it. And um, uh, today I realize, I strongly believe, and I feel that I belong to it. So that's, to me, that's the uh, most important reason why I act for biodiversity, yeah. No, that's great. And I think one of the things that I think is actually one of the challenges we've got is that, you know, as, as people, I live in London, probably you guys live in cities, um, you know, the nearest I get to biodiversity is like that plant over there, which might well be artificial, I don't know. And it's, uh, it's difficult to connect with it, but what your stories actually um, were about actually how you experienced it physically, the mango trees, the, the, the cocoa, the, the living in that, that community. Um, and we are detached from it. So one of the things I'd really like to explore is actually I'd, um, the one thing I'd maybe disagree a bit with on is that you said that we are all kind of uh, connecting with this. But I think part of the reason why in this society, um, Soviet society was slightly different because it was very command and control. But in, in our society that we live in, there's, there's kind of uh, a passive denial and even a passive acceptance that, well, it's just all bad and there's nothing I can do about this. Um, now, obviously, through either through your organisations or directly through what your work, you're looking to take kind of radical action, get things moving, which is what we need because we've already passed those boundaries. We don't just need to conserve now; we need to restore, which is actually inspiringly what's happening in Uzbekistan. So, I'd be interested in your thoughts about how do we take people on a journey. Uh, especially around biodiversity, which is m even more complex to, to grasp than climate change. Uh, how do we take people from that kind of passivity into that kind of radical change that is needed? Easy question. <laughs> I've got a strong view on this. I think uh, we need people to feel things in addition to understand things. Uh, at Reforest Action, we've got two missions. Uh, raise people awareness on forests, climate, biodiversity, and act radically by restoring, protecting, planting forests. And um, the way we raise people's awareness, which is your point, right, is to bring them in forests, uh, be on site. And uh, we invite them to plant trees. But we invite them to plant trees in a specific way by paying attention to what they do, being in the moment, and you know, um, uh, paying attention to their um, the fact that they dig a hole, they put a tree, they they water the tree, and they name the tree, they take a picture with the tree, and so on. But the goal is not to plant a tree; is to feel something about this. And from the point where you you feel. Um, that you're doing something great, well, then after you want to protect it, right? And it's something to plant a forest, but it's even better to make sure this forest grows in a good shape. But if your daily life puts at risk this forest because of the CO2 emissions you provide, because of uh, you know everything you do on a daily basis, then you're not consistent with yourself and with the fact that you've planted a forest, but you know it will not last forever, this forest, because you're putting it at risk. So to me, the, the entering point is to make sure that they feel something when restoring uh, uh, biodiversity or an environment. Right, thank you. Right. Uh, I, I fully agree with the emotional connection and um, you know, with, the, with our company and our foundation, we're also organizing this big event called Ozar, like for the trees, um, that basically bring together um, uh, 10,000 uh, visitors uh, expected this year, but also 35 NGOs, 10 companies, and also public partners, and uh, to try to indeed also uh, recreate this uh, emotional connection around the trees, and also all the impact on biodiversity, and also realizing that uh, we need to be together to really foster change and bring a lot of you know, perspectives around the table. Because I think one challenge, and you mentioned it around biodiversity, is it's actually a bit overwhelming by its complexity and it's, it's very hard to understand. You're right, like climate change at least has this 
carbon metric that we can track, uh, but biodiversity is a very, it can be a barbarian name. So, um, so by breaking it down in, in really concrete topics, trying to uh, understand what it uh, relates to, like first, up until recently uh, at, at Maison du Monde, we were focusing on using sustainable materials, but it's also about uh, plastic and, and, and packagings and the buildings. So bringing all of these voices to the table and, and trying to find pragmatic solutions, uh, I think is, uh, is, a, is a key element for change. Thank you. I think that, and that's what we try to do with the environmental intelligence piece, I think what we have to do is to remember. I think we've forgotten collectively how to be, and I, I, I always go back to this example, but my father always had a garden. He, every vegetable I ate when I was a kid was actually produced by my father. And he has an incredible environmental intelligence. He can watch the sky and tell you if it's going to rain in four hours. He can tell you if this is real just by looking at it from over there. I mean, it's, it's, it's an incredible intelligence that we've lost. I think we've, we've forgotten certain... There's one thinker in the U.S. that has coined this, and it's not for me, I can't remember his name, but I think there's two speeds in life. I think there's a speed of light, which is technology, uh, the one that we know today, uh, everything goes faster and faster, and then there's the speed of life. And I think we forgot, really, to be in tune with the speed of life. And, and that's essentially what environmental intelligence is. I've, I have a, an actual definition, if I may share it. Please. So, environmental intelligence is a thorough scientific understanding of our current environmental situation. And it is using both our past ancestral wisdom, and I'll pause here because I think that there's, we're looking at permaculture and how we, we view agriculture, but I think there's a lot of it that has to be from our ancestry. And like, I want to I wanna garden the way my great-grandfather was gardening, not the way that we're gardening today. Um, I think there's a lot of things that come from ancestral wisdom that has been lost. Um, so it is... Uh, it is assessing uh, and understanding our current environmental situation using both our past ancestral wisdom and our future nascent technologies like empathic driven AI and tech for good to recreate a present in harmony with nature through biophilia and biomimetics. And I think that to complement what you just said, I think we need to remember, in order to remember, we need to integrate nature centric emotional tools. Uh, in schools um, like gardening, permaculture, astronomy, uh, light and therapeutic art, sensory and olfactive experiments. Like I think we've lost our emotional maternal. I want to use the word maternal. I think it's important. I mean, if you look at First Nations, and I've studied with First Nations, um, um, I've I spent quite a, a big amount of time in uh, in Canada with Cree nations. Uh, identifying certain rules like circularity. I mean, circular economy is not new. It is not new. It is very, very, very old. It is an ancestral method of, of uh, experiencing nature, and I think we've lost that. And I think our biggest, and I hope you agree with me on this, but I think one, I, we have a lot to do, but I think we have to start with remembering our innate, natural, maternal connection to nature. Mm. and. I so resonate with what you said. Like, we are part of it. I mean, it's either we're part of it and we move forward or we completely disassociate ourselves from her and we continue to do that because that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. And we, we go to, to a very <laughs> difficult time. So what I'm kind of hearing is actually it's a spiritual journey as much as anything. And the only thing that I'd add is actually uh, this isn't just about teaching the kids because by the time the, those kids become the people that can actually make the decisions, it'll be way too late. I mean, it's too late already in many senses, like the Aral Sea. It's way too late for that, those communities, for that sea, for that biodiversity. For the, and uh, whilst I'm, I completely understand why actually a lot of the focus in that conversation is about the communities there, there's something that's deeply uh, important about just the, the nature that we are part of. We're not separate, as you say. Um, so one of the things I actually um, I was going to have a separate conversation um, with Fiore from Survival International, but I think actually in good chat show fashion, um, we should actually invite you guys to stay if you're happy to do that, and then bring Fiore. We mainly have the conversation with Fiore, but I'd like to get, get round of applause for these guys for a beautiful conversation.
No, we'll do it across. You can stay there. And then okay. what we've got, if you just kind of hand over a uh, mic to Fiore. Uh, oh, you've thought, got yeah. the headset. Great. Yeah. So we're all sorted. So what, what we'll do is we'll maybe have a conversation for, uh, for another 10 minutes, however long it's going to take. And then we'll just feel into it in that kind of spiritual way. Um, <laughs> and then but, but bring these guys in. Because I think this, I just my intuition is there's something that yeah. it's going to be rich to have uh, a wider conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so... As I uh, suggested uh, for these guys, would you like to just introduce yourself and, and your organization as well? Yes. Um, well, hello. I am Fiore Longo. Uh, I am director of the French Office of Survival International, and I am also director of a very controversial campaign uh, to um, decolonize conservation. Um, and I am, as all survival employees, a fighter, I think. Uh, survival International is the global movement for tribal people, we fight for their survival. Um, we give them, uh, we give tribal people a platform to speak to the world. We conduct research, we conduct our own investigations, and we partner with them and try to show the violence and the racism that they are facing. Yeah, so that's like, and it's interesting, um, I only actually came across the, even the concept of decolonization um, this, uh, in 2019. And um, so if you could just kind of give, a, it's interesting for maybe other people, it's the first time they'll have heard about it. Could you give us a highlight of what decolonization is and then how it relates to conservation? Yes, well, um, actually, to explain what the the colonized conservation means, I need to explain what, why conservation is colonialist. Uh, we think that uh, conservation actually is based uh, on a racist idea that we know better than anyone else how to protect the environment. This model of conservation that we call fortress conservation um, is centered in the idea that we need to protect, create protected areas uh, without human beings. And um, we think it's colonialist because, of course, it's a land grab. It, they are stealing the land of tribal peoples, uh, um, big conservation organizations that uh, support this model. And uh, they are actually communicating a completely wrong idea of what nature is, because what we were saying, ecosystems, are not just nature, are, uh, have been managed and uh, uh, shaped by the communities that are living there. So our idea is that um, we need to bring tribal communities, we need to bring their knowledge, and we need to bring diversity inside the debate about climate change and about, uh, in general, the debate, um, the environmental debate. Um, so that for us is the colonize, is to try to criticize ourselves and to put in the center of the conservation movement the really guardians of the natural world with our tribal communities. Yeah, great. So, and what, uh, that reflect that question that I asked at the start, what brought, what was your passion that kind of got you into this? Because you feel, it feels though you've kind of got a real, real fire in your belly. So. Yeah, well, um, I actually am an anthropologist. And I work, so I, I was working with indigenous people already before uh, joining Survival. And one of the things I really realized working with them is that actually uh, we are completely useless. They will, I will go with, for example, the Baka, which are pygmies, uh, even if they don't like that uh, word, um, in the, the forest of Congo, inside the forest, and I will just feel completely useless. And I realized that we actually are sometimes completely useless. And uh, that we, um, and it, so then that I decide to do something about it. I say, we, we are destroying the life of these people um, by our way of living, uh, but also by our way of seeing them. We think they are primitive. We think they are not contemporary. And it's actually very interesting how some organizations represent tribal communities um, because they change like us. So you, will, you can find inside the forest someone, you know, trying to find the Wi-Fi with the cell phone, really. Uh, it's, it's, it's impressive, but yes. So I try, uh, so I joined Survival especially um, because these are, uh, it's the only organization that I think uh, the, the idea of tribal communities is very respectful of what they really are. And I didn't know at that point that big conservation organizations like WWF or WCS were actually uh, doing national parks in Africa and in Asia, and they were evicting people, and they were uh, supporting eco guards, park rangers, that they were committing abuses and violence against them. Uh, and I was sent completely by chance to India, and I um, sit down with indigenous communities that they were telling me our main problem are not mining companies. Here we have the park rangers. It's a tiger reserve or problem because they, are, they came here, they uh, said this is a tiger reserve, you have to go out. 
Even evidence proved that when tribal people have the right to their land, the number of tigers increase. And I was completely shocked. Um, we all think that conservation and biodiversity is something good. And it's not like, we, we all know that there are bad multinational companies you know, that they're stealing the resource. That, that I, I, was, I think that was the first, my first decolonizing revolution in my mind. I, I realized that we, we need to ask more questions about everything and that we can't at all accept things like they are. That e behind, every behind every thought of Western society, there is a mythology. There is a storytelling that mm. we are telling ourselves and that we need to go and to ask ourselves, is this true? Is this conservation good? Why we, are think, we, are, we, we think that only through protected areas we can reach the conservation goals. And so, uh, interesting, there. How, w do you have any ideas as to how that story uh, of that we need to completely clear out the humans um, to be able to preserve something, how do you think that story took hold? Well, uh, the idea of national park, as we are using it today, born in the United States, with the first national, well, it was not national at that point, it was a state park, uh, Yosemite, and, uh, and it was created by evicting the indigenous communities that were living there. It's a very, it was based in a very Western and Protestant idea that the nature was something beautiful created by God and we, were, we, are, we have sin inside. We, we are going to destroy the nature. But actually it's not the man that is going to destroy the nature. It's, going to, it's a particular t type of man and a particular type of society. So that idea that, that, that this we need to create inviolate spaces and that those spaces are wild. This is a very powerful idea also in the, in the, in this, in the first national park. The wilderness, uh, which is linked to the uh, Anglo-Saxon and Protestant culture, which is a complete mythology. The most important biodiversity places in the world, like Amazonia, Serengeti, Yellowstone, have all been shaped by indigenous communities. The 80% of the biodiversity is in indigenous people's land. Interesting. So what, and what on a practical basis then is Survival International doing to kind of like uh, work with this? We are fighting. <laughs> and uh, so the first thing that we start doing is changing the narrative. That was the most important thing. Um, it's an ideological battle because on the ground, even if now WWF is changing their, their what we call their propaganda machine, uh, in on the ground, the things are exactly the same. Eco guards, park rangers are beating, raping, torturing people that go inside the national parks to hunt because they need to hunt to feed their families. We are talking about tribal communities. I didn't say that, but they, they are dependent on the land. They have a special uh, connection with the land. And, and they are, have been hunting and collecting and uh, gathering food and s since ever. And so we, we go there and we tell them, you can't hunt. That's it's a sent sentence of death. We are actually condemning them to starving. And um, so this, what we are doing at the beginning, was just uh, uh, we start doing was showing what was going on. As I was saying, just creating this kind of mental revolution in other people. Look, WWF is doing this. And that was already a lot. A, a lot of people were refusing to believe. And until they go there and they see by their own eyes. Um, we are, as I was saying, criticizing one of the most incredible mythologies in Western society that are linked. Think about National Geographic, all the animals, uh, the, the charismatic man, the elephant, the tigers. Think about all the documentaries you have seen where they're just animals. You, you never seen tribal communities with the animals. And you see this white guy, an adventurer, that go there and try to save the planet. And there is no, no black person in the documentary. Think about all, all these kind of things. It's, it's, it was really, at the beginning, was a very ideological battle to change the way we have been raised. We have been raised thinking that the Amazon, the Amazon forest is just a forest and there is no people inside. So we, we try to challenge this by showing the crimes. We conduct investigations. Uh, we uh, um, also sometimes give the information to the press that now it's, it's starting to raise this issue. And we, are, uh, we created the debate. That was the, the, first, the first step. Now we are also doing, not us, but the governments are starting finally to um, think, to have a doubt about conservation. Conservation was something no one was doubting. Now the, the doubt exists. And I think that is, 
the, the biggest victory we have had until now. So are you kind of uh, identifying that? It's almost the word conservation and what goes behind that word is, is actually one of the, the, the challenges. Yeah, so it's actually exactly. quite interesting that we, this was called biodiversity conversation and then our final speaker is challenging that. So what is it about that word that you think is the kind of uh, what's underlying the issues with it? We, conservation actually means that we need to conserve, to preserve because we are destroying. Mm. Tribal communities, as we were saying, the circular idea, the reciprocity, they, they don't think about preserve, they, are part, they, don't think the na they don't see the nature as something different from human beings. It's part of who they are. They will never take, for example, all the honey, the honey, or they will not hunt all the elephants because they know their kids will have to l rely on this elephant or that honey or whatever. The, the, there is no the idea to protect in a certain way. They protect it by because they need it, um, but not only for their material needs, which is something I al always explain to people. They just don't not only about depend. They don't depend on the forest just to eat. It's their entire existence as people. So actually, evicting them to protect the, the forest means that they are going to be eliminated as people. And, and, and while the idea of protected area that is, is fundamental, is in the center of conservation, means that we need to keep inviolated spaces. And also, it's, very, it's a very dangerous idea because it's not never raised a question about our way of living. There is no actually, no scientific proof that says that if we just protect biodiversity and we don't do anything else, we don't stop consuming and polluting, the, the climate change will be mitigated. This is a complete mythology. Climate change can have an impact on biodiversity, but the fact that we, if we just create protected areas and we protect our biodiversity, this is not going to have any impact on climate change if we don't uh, stop polluting. Mm. And the, uh, to the, the, the conservation um, um, ideology actually put all the accent in the conserve, in protect, and not in the, pol in the, the in the root of the problem, which is our way of living, the growth, para the, the paradigm of growth, and the industrialized society. So great. So what I'm going to do, actually, for the, the three that's still on the stage, right? Um, what I'm going to suggest is think about either a question you'd like to ask, um, or maybe a point that has that you've kind of prompted in your head. I'm very happy either either of those, but I'm just going to ask one uh, question myself before uh, I hand over to these guys, um, is what's the word that you'd replace conservation with? So it's biodiversity something, what, what, so that we can kind of get grasp that, so we've got something. What would be a good word, do you Land think? Land rights for indigenous people. I think that that would be. Uh, evidence prove that indigenous p in indigenous territory, um, indigenous people achieve equal, if not more, conser conservation goals than any protected area. Now that's, now one of the things is that's a very, sp so that's specific to when we've got uh, these territories, mm -hmm. but the thing biodiversity conservation is like it can be in, I know Reforest does it in just outside of Paris, or even some organizations do it within cities. Yeah. So, so what, w I, I, what I'm hearing maybe is we need to create almost two separate sort of like understandings. One for like the countries that we're living in, France, mm -hmm. England, whatever. But then also where there is the kind of uh, the native land rights are there, we need a, no a kind of a different yeah. concept. Would that, would that make sense? Yes, yes. But it, it would all in any case, they are very linked. It's just... It's we I think that what we need is a revolution. <laughs> but Biodiversity revolution. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I'm a rebel, so <laughs> I, I'm up for that. Um, okay, so who would like to either ask a question or make a point? I just want to make one quick point. Um, I think what you, I mean, I want to hang out with you more. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but one, one important thing is that uh, as I also had uh, spent a lot of time with Aboriginal people, particularly First Nations in Canada, and one of the things that was one of the biggest trauma for First Nations was um, the disruption of the law of the circle. The law of the circle is one of the ancestral law in First Nations because everything is circular. So the moon, the round bellies of the mothers, uh, the earth, everything is made in circularity. And the teepee obviously is circular. And when the white men arrived on the land, the first thing they did is that they actually asked them to go and live in square homes, as we know. And it was a big disruptive uh, consequence for them because they were they were really suffering from that because they felt like they were not living in harmony with the rest of, of the earth because everything has to be a circle. Um, and I think 
I think I, I, I really resonate with what you say. I think we need to step back and I think we need to learn from Aboriginal people and First Nations and really look at how they do things because we, I mean, uh, it's, it's such a big and, and, and conflictual because there's a lot of people that are not comfortable with that. Mm. But can we learn from a guy who's just wearing like a little covered like leaf on his penis? Is it okay for a white men to listen to that guy instead of the guy with the suit? Mm. And I think that there's a big conversation that has to happen around that. And the second point I'd like to make is going back to what you said about conservation. Same thing goes with sustainability. I don't understand that word. What are we trying to sustain? I mean, that word shouldn't be banned from any environmental discussion. We should use the word regeneration. Mm. That's what we should be using because we messed it up and regeneration has to happen, not sustainability. We're sustaining what? I mean. Yeah, no, I'd agree. Actually, I've got uh, a side business. Well, it was my main business until I became a full-time rebel and called Inspiring Sustainability. And I do keep thinking that I need to change it to something like Inspiring Regeneration. Um, and do you have any sort of just follow-up points before we kind of hand over these two that like that's inspired by this conversation? Yes, uh, actually, I was thinking about the the fires that we have been uh, seeing in television, not only in, mm. in the Amazon and in Australia. And uh, it made me think uh, about the fact that um, a lot of tribal communities told me uh, when the white men arrived, they banned the litter fire. They would, they would, uh, they would fire up some every now and then um, the forest just to uh, get rid of all the, you know, all the leaves or um, all part of trees. And they will do that also to give to the soil, uh, to fertilize the soil. And then the white man, for they, we, they decide uh, that that was not good because fire for us is something that is not good. And actually, they were, t they were um, controlling, managing in this way, mm. the big fires. And now that this is forbidden, uh, in a lot of places, for example, in India, the 30, the th three the, 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 there has been a rise of 300% of fires after uh, the British banned that, uh, wow. that kind of practice. And it's the same in Australia. So actually... Um, we have to learn more from them, and uh, and it's not just because of them, and it's not just because on because of human rights, and it's just just because social justice. It's because it's our planet. They mm -hmm. have been taking care of our planet from generations, mm. right. and it's something that touch all of us. Yeah, thank you. So, Julie. Yes, I have a question for you, and thank you. That was really inspiring, indeed. Um, you mentioned that the source of the problem is the paradigm of growth we live in. Um, what's your view? I mean, is the solution around trying to stop that growth in anyhow or to find a different way, a more positive way of growing? And if so, I mean, how could that be? Well, positive way, the, the idea of growth is, is, ne is in, a, in, a, in a world that is, you know, I, it is what it is. It's, it's already dangerous. I, I don't believe we should be focusing on, on growth or solutions to keep growing while not polluting the world, I think that is very, and it's something I have been seeing in Davos, for example, there are all these people giving solutions to do business with climate change. And um, I think that is dangerous. I'm not suggesting we should be living as tribal people. I'm suggesting we should be start living in a way that is not destroying uh, the best allies of, of the environmental cause. How we do that are through uh, our political choice. I, I think that someone should have the courage to start doing this and we can vote, we can be as consumers, we can be responsible, we can say, I don't need 100 pair of shoes or I, I just need one. I think we have a responsibility as individuals, but this is, there is also political responsibility and we need to be, uh, to be careful of who we vote, but I think that we, we, it's possible to change. Our grandmothers or grandparents didn't live as we live. It's, it might be possible, otherwise, <laughs> so otherwise there is no solution. But I think you're actually representing uh, something that I uh, was thinking about. That Actually, there is definitely planetary boundaries, there's planetary limits. But what I feel is there's kind of a lot less limit on passion, which you're very well uh, uh, showing us. And also, there's uh, no limits, I think, to creativity. Um, so, you know, like just the phone that's in my pocket. Now, that is kind of part of the problem in some ways because of the rare earth minerals and all these things. But this is science fiction that's in my pocket. Um, from like even 30 years ago, it was science fiction. So that took deep creativity, but there's also creativity how we relate to each other and how we can move together. So it's one of the things is because when people think of creativity, they think of the scientific 
creativity, what's in my pocket? But actually, creativity can be how we relate as human beings um, on that spiritual basis. So maybe, Stefan, you have the privilege of the last question, <laughs> or the last point. Yeah. Um, my job is to restore forests. I know. <laughs> so um, I often uh, ask myself, do I have the right to restore forests? Mm -hmm. I belong to biodiversity, but do I have the right to restore forests? And um, because I belong to it, I think it's fair to have an impact to it because I like every living um, entity, mm -hmm. they adapt to their environment for their own needs. But I'm not um, from Senegal, from Guinea, from Kenya, from Tanzania, from Brazil, from Peru, all these countries we have actions in. So what we do is we give support to local people because we don't know what to do, they know what to do. Mm. So we provide assistance, some um, scientific, maybe technical knowledge to help them doing what they think is right. And from my point of view, it's the, the most beautiful thing I can do is to say, hey guy, you see, I believe you're a serious guy. You can do great things. You don't have money. You don't have maybe some skills. You like some knowledge. I can provide some of it, but you know what to do. And we provide support to local people to do what they believe is, is right, even though sometimes I don't understand what they're doing. <laughs> but it, it must be right. It works, right? Uh, so uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing that with us. It's, uh, encourages me. I, uh, I hope I'm doing the right thing, but uh, thank you for sharing that with us. So that's yeah. brilliant. And so what kind of, how would you uh, wrap up? Uh, what, what, like, you know, I was talking, asking earlier on is that I think there's, there's this, what's almost worse than passive denial is passive acceptance. That, because like we've, you, you've, you've been denying for a while and then you just go, oh, it's all too big. There's nothing I can do. Whereas it, you're, you've said you're fighting for this. Yeah. So what, what is it that you, th what, what, what message would you give to the people in this room or even hopefully people that are watching this on video afterwards that to take, for them to take that radical action to kind of help change this narrative? Well, first of all, you need to be iconoclast. We have to destroy mythologies. We have to always ask questions of that. What, what there is behind all of this? Uh, but I, I do think that the, that is the first thing, and just get information, read, understand the issues, because this is all about understanding. It's about reading, it's about uh, realizing that we are using the resource and the creativity going into the wrong idea. The, all the new policies that are now going to, they are now discussing in the European Commission, the biodiversity strategies, are now based on WWF idea of having the 30% of the world as a protected area. So there is something to do. We need to stop this. And, and we need to, to share this information and to tell to people, look, what, what, this is what, it, what we are doing. We are destroying the life of tribal people. And the other thing that we sh I think that we should be doing is always keep carry the diversity inside us. Diversity, not only gender diversity, ethnic diversity, and to push the diversity inside every conversation and inside ourselves. Because sometimes I think that the people that live more differently for us has uh, actually the best answers about how to live at all. Wonderful, that's uh, very inspiring. So just wanna uh, thank all my panelists and thank you for listening, thank you. So uh, hopefully some of you will be coming back tomorrow and uh, I'm actually doing a session in the morning about empowering citizens where I'm actually, I'm going to be sitting in their place because I'm going to be representing Extinction Rebellion UK and about how we're looking to empower citizens. And then in the afternoon um, we're doing uh, one on uh, oceans and how we protect the oceans. Um, so, uh, but this has just been a fabulous conference and I just want to say from myself, thank you to the organisers for making this happen. It's an amazing event and uh, as we've said, it's grown like exponentially over the last uh, three editions. So, uh, thank you all. If I, if I may, if I mm. may, one thing. Um, we're showing uh, a content that we created for Change Now, which is on the refugee crisis and it will be shown tomorrow at 6pm. Wonderful. In 
this arena, I believe. Great. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Can you see? Yeah.